exactly the reason why we are doing verification in the first place. So this doesn't work either. Now the question is, would it be nice if we could come up with some method that would give the server the same guarantees than if it did the verification by itself, while also benefiting from the processing savings we get by letting the clients do the job? And this is actually what I called cooperative runtime monitoring. Uh, to describe the idea, here's a graph where the horizontal axis gives the computational savings of using a method rather than the other, and the vertical axis shows the guarantees the server has. So if we were to put a dot corresponding to client-side monitoring, where would it go in this graph? Well, in client-side monitoring, the server has complete computational savings since it doesn't perform any verification and completely trusts the client. But on the other side, it doesn't have any guarantee that the messages follow the contract for that same reason. So client-side monitoring goes at the lower right of the graph. In the same way, if we want to put a dot for server-side monitoring, we have the opposite, complete guarantees for the server, but at the price of doing all the work, so top left corner. We can imagine various intermediate solutions between these two extremes where you have maybe less guarantees but for a bit less work and so on. In cooperative runtime monitoring, we want to achieve a compromise between these two extremes, but this depends on the shape of the graph between server and client-side monitoring. So if we have a straight line between the two, this means that as soon as you want to achieve some computational saving on the server side, you also have to surrender some of the guarantees or alternately start trusting the client to some extent. If this is indeed the case, then we can't do cooperative runtime monitoring because remember, we want to save some computing on the server but still retain complete guarantees as if the server checked everything by itself. However, if the curve has a plateau on the left, then it means that we can devise a way of offloading some processing to the client without having to start trusting it even the least bit. And this is where there's potential for cooperation. Here's a sketch of how cooperative runtime monitoring works. You have two monitoring processes, one on the client side and the other on the server side. Remember that the interface contract relies on the notion of state of the protocol. So in the beginning, the client and the server processes maintain the current state of the message exchange, so here S. Suppose then that the client wants to send a message to the server. So from its current state S, and given the message A it wants to send, the client side process uses a function gamma to compute two things. Uh, S prime is the new contract state, the result of applying the transition function to S with message A. And the yellow brick in the picture represents a proof that A is a valid extension of the message exchange from the current state. The message is then sent to the server along with the proof. When the server receives it, it will do two things. First, the function mu takes the client's message and its proof and simply checks that the proof is consistent with the message. That is, that the client did not try to smuggle a proof for a different message or that the message has not been altered after the proof for it has been computed. The function mu returns true if everything is fine and false otherwise. Then once the server is convinced that the proof is genuine, it uses it to derive the new state of the protocol, S prime, from its current state S, and it does that using the function new. The end result is that both sides now agree on the new current state S prime. What is different is how each side computed it. The client computed it from S and A, while the server computed it from S and the proof prepared by the client. And this is important in the rest of the presentation. The top of this picture shows the three functions involved in the process of sending a message. Of course, for such a thing to work properly, we must express requirements on each function. Uh, the first one is obvious. Uh, the proof must be unspoofable. Uh, the server could not trust a proof if it knows that the client can tamper with it or with the message that is sent once, once it has been computed. Um, the second requirement is also fairly natural. Since the server uses the proof to derive the next state of the protocol, that computation must lead it to the same state than if it simply computed the transition function from the message itself. Okay? 
And finally, the whole point of the scheme is to save some processing on the server side, so checking the proof must be easy. And by easy, we mean here running in polynomial time. Then these requirements can be translated formally into conditions on the functions uh, gamma, mu, and nu. Um, an unspoofable proof means that if the message A is not a valid continuation from state S, then whatever proof you produce is either a spoof, which will be rejected by function nu, or if the proof is genuine, then it will lead the server into the empty state and make it realize that it doesn't follow the protocol. So either way, you can't have the server accept message A, so you're safe. Now for a proof to be equivalent to monitoring, it simply means that if the client gets S prime as the next protocol state, in the end, the server accepts the proof and also computes S prime as the next protocol state. So this is exactly what we say here. And finally, checking a proof in polynomial time corresponds to the definition of the NP complexity class. So we want mu and nu to be NP functions, not necessarily NP complete, but in NP. You'll notice that up to now I haven't expressed any preference as to the formal language to use for the interface contract. Uh, indeed, as long as you have functions gamma, mu, and nu that follow these constraints, then you have cooperative runtime monitoring. But now to fix the ideas, I'll introduce one language suitable for expressing interface contracts, but keep in mind that you could use another one. Uh, the language in question is called Linear Temporal Logic, or LTL. Uh, an LTL expression is an assertion on a trace of messages. Uh, you have four main operators in LTL, G, X, F, and here W, or it can also be U. Uh, if you have a formula that is preceded by a G, it means that this formula must always be true for every message of the trace. If you have X, it means next, so it means that what follows applies to the next message of the trace. Uh, if you have F in front of an expression, it means that some message in the future will follow that expression. And finally, the W operator has two operands, and it states that what's on the left is true for every message until one of them satisfies what's on the right. Um, so if we have a trace of messages, A, B, A, C, D, etc., then the first LTL formula at the left of the picture states that if a message is A, then the next message is B. And this must always be true since we have a G in front of the expression. We can check that on the trace, this, is, um, this formula is false since the third symbol is an A but it's followed by a C. I won't do the details, but one can easily check that the second LTL formula is true on that trace. What's interesting about LTL is that, one, it allows us to express constraints on sequences of symbols, so sequences of messages in our case, and two, uh, there exists an algorithm that can monitor an LTL formula on the fly on any trace of messages. Uh, the trick is to decompose the original formula into nodes in a tree, and each node being form of two sides. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have LTL formulas that must be true now, and on the right-hand side, the LTL formulas that must be true in the next state or the next message. Uh, it's fairly easy to decompose an LTL formula. Uh, for, for example, if on the left-hand side you have a formula that starts with G followed by something phi, then it means that phi must be true now, but also that G phi must be true in the next message, of course, since G means that phi must be true always. Uh, similarly, if you have x phi, then it simply means that phi must be true in the next message. So x disappears and phi goes to the right-hand side of the node. Uh, some decomposition rules produce more than one child, <clears throat> such as the f operator. So if f phi is true, it means either that phi is true in the current message, or that f phi is true in the next one, and multiple branches in the tree must be seen at, as alternatives. Um, you perform a couple of transformations on the original formula, and once you're done decomposing, you're left with a tree whose leaves on the left-hand side contain only basic formulas that are called atoms, or negations of atoms. These basic formulas are conditions on the current message that you evaluate, and each returns true or false. Uh, ultimately, if all leaves contain one formula that evaluated to false, then the original formula, uh, LTL formula itself is false. If one of the leaves is empty, that is, it contains nothing on the right-hand side, and its left-hand side evaluates to true, 
then we conclude that the original LTL formula itself is true. Otherwise, we can't conclude. We take all the leaves that don't contain false, we move their right-hand side to the left, and we wait for the next message. 